The histories are genuinely one of the most interesting species of life that live on Nern, and in part, this is due to their mysterious natures. When I began researching for this video, I went in with one goal in mind, to discover more about the Hist. And I'm happy to share with you the information that I found. I will warn you, I went on a bit of a micro rant about Bethesda at the end of this video, so if that interests you, please stick around until the end. Regardless, thank you for clicking on the video. Uh, this video will contain major spoilers for the Elder Scrolls novels, The Infernal City and The Lord of Souls, so if you're intending to read those at any point, you may want to add this video to your Watch Later playlist and watch it at a different time. Anyway, let's begin. The Hist, in the simplest of terms, are a sentient species of spore trees that mostly inhabit the region of Tamriel called Blackmarsh, and they are revered by the Argonian people for spiritual and cultural importance. But you didn't click on this video for the simplest of terms, now did you? Hist trees are said to all be connected at the root, forming a hive mind network that stretches not only throughout the Blackmarsh, but also into distant lands. This hive mind of trees has a significant influence over anyone who partakes in tasting the sap that flows from their bark, especially so for Argonians, who are said to have been made by the very trees themselves. To quote from The Infernal City, an Elder Scrolls novel taking place between Oblivion and Skyrim, The hist were many, and they were one. Their roots burrowed deep beneath the black soil and soft white stone of Blackmarsh, connecting them all, and thus connecting all Sax Leal, all Argonians. The Hist gave his people life, form, and purpose. The Argonian people refer to themselves as the Sax Leal, which means the people of the root, which goes to show just how important these beings are to one another. Argonian eggs are incubated and hatched in hatching pools composed of Hist sap and raised imbibing the liquid, which gives them a direct connection to the Hist trees. This connection seems to be mostly one way, as in the Hist trees commune with the Sax Leal, and the Sax Leal listen rather than talk back. It is also said that Argonians born outside of the Black Marsh cannot hear the call of the Hist. So needless to say, these trees are a really cool part of the Elder Scrolls lore, specifically Argonian and Black Marsh lore, but in order to dive any deeper into the specific details of the Hist trees, we must first establish where they came from in the first place. In my Thalmor video, we heavily discussed the book called The Anuid, which is a foundational story about the Elder Scrolls universe as a whole. We'll need to reference this book once more to get the full picture here of what exactly the Hist are and where they come from. I know I've outlined this in different ways before in several videos so far, but each video could be someone's first, so I'm going to explain it again. So, the Elder Scrolls universe was created from the interplay between Anu and Padme, essentially the forces of stasis and change. The Anuid tells us that the being produced from this interplay was named Nir, N-I-R, not to be confused with Nirn, N-I-R-N. There was somewhat of a love triangle between Anu, Nir, and Padme. See, Anu and Padme were both stunned by Nir's beauty, but she only loved Anu, leaving Padme to sulk in his lonesome. He's just like me, for real. Nir eventually became pregnant with Anu's child, only for Padme to return, professing his love for her. Upon rejection, Padme, again the avatar of change and chaos, beat her in his rage. Okay, I take it back. <laughs> He's not just like me, for real. Anu returned and threw Padme outside of time, and Nur was able to give birth to her and Anu's child, creation, but suffering immensely from Padme's rage, she died from her injuries soon after the birth. It is said that there were initially twelve worlds of creation, and life began to spring anew on each, flourishing in their times. However, in a plot twist akin to Chancellor Palpatine's resurrection, somehow Padme returned. Somehow Palpatine returned. Creation only reminded him more of the betrayal and hatred that he felt towards Anu and Nur, and in another act of rage, he swung his sword, cleaving the twelve worlds asunder. Anu and Padme again had an epic clash for the ages, and Anu rose as the victor once more. He salvaged what he could from creation, forming the twelve worlds that were, into one, which we now call Nirn, N-I-R-N. The only two survivors of the twelve worlds, according to the Anuid, were supposedly the Elnafe and the Hist. 
it really makes one wonder what the original realms in which the Elnafe and the Hist may have existed and looked like, assuming that this myth is true in the first place. Now, the Elnafe would eventually create factions and wage wars against one another, and the Hist are said to have been bystanders during this time. Most of their original realm was said to have been destroyed during these wars, but a small corner of it survived to become Black Marsh and Tamriel, with the rest of it sinking beneath the sea. So, we now know a few more things about the Hist. Number one, they're one of the oldest races on Tamriel, and number two, they're of a completely distinct origin from the races of Man and Mur, which descended from the Elnafe. This makes the Hist, in a world almost run entirely by the descendants of the Elnafe, somewhat alien in nature to the rest of the inhabitants of Tamriel, which is why to so many of the Men and Mur of the Elder Scrolls, the Hist and the Argonians are often thought of in such an odd way. Also, while the Elnafe eventually split off and turned into distinct groups of people, it would appear that the Hist have remained unchanged throughout time, making them one of the oldest beings in Tamriel. So it would stand to reason, then, that the Hist, being a sentient race of trees that predates essentially all of the modern Tamrielic cultures, would have some valuable insight into the world in some ways, right? Well, yes, actually. In the book titled The Monomyth, the foreword states that Sithis is thus the original creator. Even the Hist acknowledge this being. Sithis, also known as Padme, does make some sense to worship in this way, as, at least according to the Anuid, it was through his rage that the modern version of creation even came about, making him, in a sense, the original creator. Indeed, the Hist and therefore the Argonians have referred to Sithis as a pillar of their culture, presumably since the dawn of time, and this comes back around to my point about the unique worldview provided by these trees. It's unclear as to how long the Argonians have been around, but we know that they are at least contemporaries with the Aldmeri people, as is evidenced by Topol the Pilot's voyage to Black Marsh, wherein he saw what has been translated as human lizards. Now, just like everything else in this lore series thus far, Topol the Pilot's voyages are not very well recorded, and some of the exact translations of this poem may be inaccurate slightly, but I think that it's still fair to say that Topol the Pilot came across Argonian culture while he was searching for Old Altmeris. This was during the Marethic era, before the Ages of Man. This means that the Argonian people have been on Tamriel far longer than most of the other races of beings. They predate the arrival of Iskrimor, for example. They predate the Alessian Rebellion in Cyrodiil. They predate the Chimer people becoming the Dunmer, etc, etc, etc. Again, this is just to show how truly ancient and primordial the Hist and the Argonians are in their storied histories and pasts. Like I said before, the Argonians rear their young, who are hatched from eggs, inside of pools of Hist sap while they incubate. From their beginnings, Argonians born within Black Marsh are raised imbibing the sap that flows from the trees, which gives them an inherent connection to the Hist in a way that Argonians born outside of Black Marsh are stated to not have access to. Interestingly, though, during the Oblivion Crisis, the Hist trees called back all Argonians to Black Marsh in order to defend their homeland against the Daedric invasion of Meru's Dagon, which I just wanted to point out goes to show how much control the Hist really can have over the Argonians should they wish it. Anyway, back to their ancient culture. The ancient Argonians feared Sithis, viewing him as a destroyer deity, which again makes sense given the history of Padme. In an effort to stave off the destructive nature of Sithis, the Old Ones created massive stone structures, called Zanmirs, that were intended to stand the test of time against the change and destruction of Sithis. The ancient Argonians are stated to have performed ritual sacrifice in honor of Sithis during this time, which is interesting considering that this is how the Dark Brotherhood thinks to honor Sithis as well, although in a different way entirely. And that's not even to mention Shadow Scale culture. As a real-life historical aside, because you know I can't help myself, the Argonian Zanmirs look a lot like the ancient pyramids in Mesoamerica that we can see, specifically Chichen Itza on the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Combined with the ritual sacrifice, it's fairly clear to see the Aztec slash Maya influence on the Argonian cultures in the Elder Scrolls. Obviously, if one takes a stroll through Black Marsh now, even in the Elder Scrolls Online during the Second Era, one will see a notably different interpretation of the Argonians and the Hist. This has to do with a phenomenon called Duskfall. 
Duskfall is, by nature, vague, but in general, it refers to the decline of the ancient Saxlil culture in favor of a new one. The paradigm shift during this period was in the interpretation of Sithis, who went from being seen as a destroyer deity to be feared, to a deity who was more perceived as being purely of change, inevitability. These Argonians began to rebel against the fear of death, referred to as Shunte in their culture, and they began to embrace this inevitability of Sithis. Modern Argonians, starting at least by 1st era 198, have since abandoned the Xanmirs, although they still litter Blackmarsh and are sometimes used as gathering places. However, the Sax Leal, since abandoning the old ways, manifested their new beliefs in a way by building within nature as opposed to trying to outlast it. The Xanmirs of old were replaced with mud huts and reed-crafted walls, which could easily be destroyed at a moment's notice. By creating impermanent structures in tune with nature, the modern Argonians of Blackmarsh see themselves as having found peace with the inevitable change of Sithis, and have become one with the change that surrounds them. It is stated that the Hist, in some way, knew that the Duskfall period was to come about eventually, and while there are some trees that appear to have been against it, it is largely implied that most all of the Hist were responsible in some way for the Duskfall coming about at all. In my eyes, given the closely tied nature between the Saxlil and the Hist, I believe that Duskfall directly represents a change in the relationship between the Hist's beliefs about Sithis, which in turn was reflected in Argonian culture as well. With regards to the Hist being ever enigmatic, I doubt we'll ever truly get an answer as to why the Hist's beliefs changed, but ultimately it doesn't really matter to the overall picture being painted here. The Hist and the Argonians' cultures, then, seem irrevocably connected, just like most other things between the two species of beings. However, although Argonians are supposed to be interconnected to the entire network of the hive mind of trees, it would appear that, every once in a while, some trees can act on their own, which leads to distinct groups of Argonians emerging. Sometimes throughout history, a hist tree will be cut off from the others, implying that, despite generally talking with a unified voice, the hist do have their own goals and ambitions as individuals as well. I wanted to do a little bit more research on this, and I found myself learning about a woman by the name of Suzanne Simard, who is a professor of forest ecology at the University of British Columbia and the author of Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, which is a book that I'll have linked below on Amazon should you like to read it. I, however, am far too lethal a mixture of busy and lazy to actually read anything other than Elder Scrolls novels and lore pages, so I took to watching her TED Talks instead and reading up on her research elsewhere. As it turns out, Suzanne's research into forest ecology led to a supremely interesting discovery about how real-life trees can actually talk and communicate with one another in a forest. Now, keep in mind that I am not a biologist or anything, and I'll have her video linked below as well, but from what I understand about her research, trees in a forest are able to speak with one another in a sense, through their roots and an interconnected web of mycelium networks that runs throughout the soil. It would appear that while trees may seem dormant at a first glance, they are actually sentient enough to know when to, say, donate some of its nutrition to a nearby tree in need, for example. This fascinated me as I was learning more about this particular section of the histories because, just like in Suzanne's research, it would appear that every once in a while, a hist tree makes a decision to do something that is sort of outside of its own network. The tree at Haj Uxith, for example, was aware that Duskfall was to come, but it didn't want its tribe to abandon its old ways, so it disconnected from the Hist hive mind and made a deal with Molag Bal in order to ensure the survival of its tribe and their pre-Duskfall culture. The tree at Mazatun, Sono Zuhil, was another tree set on defying Duskfall, and allied with its Argonian tree minder, Nakesh, they sought to preserve the old ways of Sithis worship in the everlasting city of stone. While being invaded by the Aliads, the Hist tree of the Root Whisper tribe sacrificed itself to preserve the souls of its tribe members in an artifact called the Remnant of Argon. After doing so, the Root Whisper tree fell into a deep slumber, becoming known as the Dreaming Tree thereafter. Each of these times that the Hist broke off from the network, it was for a personal reason. To ensure survival, either of the cultures of their surrounding Argonians, or of the very lives of the tribes themselves. 
Very similar to how in Suzanne Simard's research, sometimes the trees must make individual decisions to help those around them survive. However, when talking about the rogue hist tree of Lilmoth, this is not one such tree. This one is perhaps the most notorious of all of the rogue hists. It was raised from a single root of the original tree that existed prior to it some 300 years before its declared independence from the network. By 4th Era 8, the Hist of Lilmoth began refusing to communicate with anyone who was not of the Anzalil, or the Wild Ones faction. I should briefly talk on the Anzalil before we go a little bit further. The Anzalil are a political faction composed of almost entirely Argonians that formed sometime during the Oblivion Crisis to combat the Daedric Hordes invading Blackmarsh. It is a commonly held belief that it was through their counter-strikes into the Deadlands that Black Marsh was able to stave off the attacks from Merun's Dagon during this era. The Anzalil exist now as an entity that is dead set on returning to the old ways of pre-Duskfall Argonia, and on expelling the influence from any colonial influences on their culture, namely Imperial. Flipping back to the Lilmoth tree, the Anzalil members within Lilmoth only took orders from this tree as well. The rogue hist of Lilmoth was directly responsible for what was referred to as the Umbriel Crisis in year 48 of the Fourth Era, wherein it made a connection with the unnamed cousins of the hist, the trees of Umbriel, and allowed for the floating island to enter the Mundus and wreak havoc across Tamriel on its way towards the Imperial City. So it should be clear by this point that the hist, despite being a hive mind network, can and do have their own individual wants and needs. At this point, I would like to take the time to delve a little bit further into the Umbriel trees, as they are supremely interesting to me, and I think they're important in a way that I have not really heard discussed before. So, Mirglim, one of the protagonists of the Greg Key's Elder Scrolls novels, is an Argonian. A central theme of these books is Argonian culture and the exploration of that typically comes from Glim's POV during his chapters. Essentially, what happens in this book is that the rogue Hist of Lilmoth has let in a floating island from Oblivion housing a city on top, and this city is known as Umbriel. On this floating island are a race of trees that are apparently very similar to the Hist trees of Blackmarsh, and Glim describes them as cousins of the Hist. These trees are said to have had leaves that were too oblate, bark that was less fretted, and a smell that was a bit off when comparing them to the Hist trees of Tamriel. Now, I'll be skipping a lot here in these books, but in the end of Lord of Souls, the island gets transported back to the realm from which the Hist cousins are from, and Mirglim stays with the island, so we get to see it from his perspective. It's crazy to me that this section of the book does not get more coverage from people. The UESP labels this place as the Realm of the Hist, but I'm genuinely not certain that this is the case, though I could be wrong. Mirglim states that this is where the trees are from, with trees being italicized, but he does not specify if he's talking about the Hist trees, the trees of Umbriel, or both. Regardless, I find this realm of trees that they enter at the end of the novel to be so important, as it shows us a possible location that the Hist originated from, and lends further credence to the idea of the original twelve realms of creation that were shattered by Sithis, as is laid out in the Anuid. Maybe it was this discovery of this realm that caused the paradigm shift in Hist culture, seeing now that Sithis did not destroy the original home of the trees, but simply changed it. It's possible that the trees had connected with their cousins in this place at some point prior to this novel and realized the error of their ways. I know this theory doesn't have much foundation to stand on, but I kind of like it as a headcanon reason for Duskfall. But the main point I wanted to bring up about this book was that it confirmed that there is a realm out there in Oblivion somewhere that exists, mostly composed of trees that are either the Hist or relatives of the Hist, and I find that to be something that should be explored at some point further in the series. I would personally love another Elder Scrolls novel, honestly. I mean, if Fallout can get an entire Amazon TV show, I don't think it's too much for me to ask for one 200-page book, Todd. Like, really? So, I think that if there's something to take away from this video, it's that the culture of the Argonian people and the histories is really unique and weird, 
and I'd really love to see them explored more thoroughly in future titles, as for far too long in The Elder Scrolls we've been seeing a simplification of these factors about the series that made the lore so rich and inspired. Make The Elder Scrolls cool again, please. Honestly, as an avid Elder Scrolls fan myself, I really didn't feel like I had learned as much from my research on this video as I usually do when I'm writing these lore dives, and I think that's a shame, really. When I was researching stuff for the Mana Marco video, I genuinely found some interesting tidbits of lore. When I was researching stuff for the uh, when I was researching stuff for the Mankar Cameron video, it kind of blew my mind delving deeper into his philosophy. Unfortunately, a lot of stuff about the Hist trees is already fairly well known. Elder Scrolls has not received meaningful new lore in quite some time, it feels, although the people at ESO try their best to make things interesting. My point with this is to say that eventually, unless we get a new game soon, and by new game I mean a real game, then we'll run out of things to explore very quickly. I tried to make this video at least a bit unique by trying to add in some facts about real-life research into tree communication, but Suzanne Simard's book was released in 2021, making it 10 years younger than Skyrim, meaning that there was no actual inspiration from her research on the Elder Scrolls histories after all. And I know that this has gotten a bit ranty at the end here, but I just hope that we're all in agreement that Bethesda needs to throw us a bone here soon. There's only so many times that someone can replay Skyrim until it starts to show how hollow that game is when compared to the games that have come out since. And this is partially Bethesda's fault. If they continue to re-release a game that is 13 years old at this point, we're going to compare it to things that are coming out at the same time that it's re-released. It's just a fact. And all that that does is start to glare a flashlight on a game that is filled with flaws that has no business being re-released in the same years of some other amazing titles. Someone put it very well in one of my Baldur's Gate live streams that we did recently, and I apologize because my chats are not saved on those, so I can't cite who said it exactly, but it was something along the lines of, I will always be a Skyrim fan, but that does not mean that I'll always be a Bethesda fan. And that sums things up quite nicely for me. If Bethesda wants to keep me buying their games, they need to show me that they actually care. Anyway, it's time for me to thank my amazing channel members who have been kind enough to donate a small amount of their income to support the work that goes into the creation of these videos. Special thank you to Wet Noodle, Naji aka Tracy, Jug, B Wolf, Aaron Dobbs, Dishonored Pro 3500, Ophelia Drowning, Ken P. Lamont Diamenti, OOP, Ruin Cod, Breezy Stratton, Zhang Gina, The Thin White Duke, Joel Evers, Debash, Inherent Manax, Solus 6 x TJ, Username Here, Peace, Ranger McKay, Inked Up, The Heat Inferno, YB, Dennis Riverola, Jake AS, uh, I believe this name is pronounced Gletscherminza, Combat Cat 99, Fry Sky 2X, Skuma Addict, and Danny S. These people are all awesome, it's always fun chatting live with you guys and seeing you in the comments and in the Discord, so again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. My personal links will be included down below, such as Twitter, which I barely use, Discord, Twitch, and my second channel. I have been doing a lot of streaming on YouTube as opposed to Twitch lately since members get to use their emotes here in chat, and I think that's fun, so please feel free to check out the several live streams that have been built up on the channel thus far. If you enjoyed the video at all, please leave a like, comment, or share, and if you'd like to stick around for further videos, please click subscribe. If you'd like to join the channel as a member, please find the link below in the description to find out more about the program and the benefits that come along with it, or if you're already subscribed, you can click the join button where the subscription button usually would be. Okay, now that I'm done plugging my own stuff, I will catch you guys all in the next one. Peace out.